Well, welcome everyone. Buongiorno. It's great to have all of you with us here at the Father Greg McLeod Lecture Series. This lecture series is sponsored by the Newman Society as well as CBU Chaplaincy. I am Father Doug McDonald, the CBU Chaplain, and we're coming to you tonight from Cape Breton University in Sydney, Nova Scotia, Canada. We're going to get right into this relevant lecture tonight because the lecturer told me last week anything can happen in northern Nigeria. He told me his seminary and his computer is being run off batteries. The internet sometimes can kick out and uh, power will die at any time. So we're grateful that our lecturer has a set of batteries as backup. Note that anything can happen in Nigeria. I just want to say that we're going to take a moment at the beginning of this lecture to honor the family of a CBU student who is living in Nigeria but takes courses online at Cape Breton University. His, family, his parents were killed in, in a, a, a horrific uh, assault, really, just last week. Our hearts are sending prayers to him at this time as he navigates his future. I also want to take a moment at the beginning to honor deceased CBU professor, anthropology professor, Dr. Margaret Dykeman. She was very involved in trying to incarnate the social doctrine of the church, if you will, in many other uh, implicit ways. And we're so grateful uh, for her contribution to the community. We remember our CBU prof now. Well, it gives me great privilege to introduce our lecturer for the fall semester of the Greg McLeod Lecture Series. I had an experience uh, where Dr. Beatrice and I, we lived in the same residence in the Convito Angelicum in Rome. And one of the incidents that stuck out in my mind from over the year was when each of the seminaries were asked to send priests who were in Rome to come to a meeting with the Holy Father at Paul VI Hall. And only one from each household could go up on stage to meet Pope Francis. So they put everybody's name in a hat. And lo and behold, Father Beatrice's name was chosen. He was chosen to meet the Holy Father. And we were very happy for him among many other residences uh, and schools in Rome. But what struck me is on our way to, to Vatican City to get into Pope Paul VI Hall, you have to go through security with the Swiss guards. And as a, as a white priest, I was able to really just walk right through and not even have to show anything. But I do recall, and I'll, I'll never forget this, some of my brother priests who I lived with being stopped, being asked extremely, uh, you know, detailed questions before they were permitted to go through into even Vatican City. I simply name that as a real life experience that we share together. He was the guy getting to meet the Holy Father, not me, yet he was being questioned and I sailed through. These are just small examples of, of the type of privilege that that we, we, we have. And so Dr. Beatrice Yulang is a PhD. He was born on May 21st, 1975. He's part of the Marie tribe. His date of ordination was August 17th, 2002. So he's 18 years a Catholic priest. He's part of the diocese of Madurguri in Northern Nigeria. Dr. Beatrice loves languages. He speaks six languages, including Chinese. He spent six years in Rome studying. He did his doctoral studies at the Pontifical Urban University in Rome. His dissertation was on the kingdom of God, according to Vatican II and the post-conciliar magisterium, an inquiry into the relevance of God's government 
of the world to man's government of the nations. Dr. Beatrice Gillings now teaches dogmatic theology, inculturation, and eschatology at St. Augustine's major seminary in Jos, Northern Nigeria, in the Jurgari Diocese. They have over 450 seminarians in residence studying. Today, Dr. Beatrice will explore the topic of what is the Christian response to racism and discrimination. Dr. Beatrice, we welcome you and the floor is yours for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Father Doug. And I'm very happy to be associated with Cape Breton University, especially the chaplaincy and all of you this evening. First and foremost, I join all of you to condole with relatives and members of your community who lost their lives, especially those to this horrific murder of the parents of one of your students. So I'm with you at prayers. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Now, I want to respond to this question. What is the Christian response to racism and religious discrimination today? As a kind of introduction, I'll say, although the times do not seem optimistic for a lot of things concerning the unity of the human family, yet I insist that we must never be pessimistic because the only thing which keeps us alive and active is hope itself, without which our faith has no bearing. Although the unfolding happenings around discriminations which take the forms of racism and religious bigotry have kept our world continuously divided and seemingly unamendable, yet it is not a reality that is not unsurmountable because it is possible to conquer evil with good. And that is the Christian way good will always conquer evil. And it is on that I insist there is light at the end of the tunnel. So this paper shall look at what is meant by racism and focus on a shade of meaning with its multidimensional facets. So after trying to define racism, it looks at the reality of racism as an evil a monster which must be denounced, abhorred, and detested by all, calling it by its ugly name. While we acknowledge its effects on the society by pointing out the victims of this horrendous and devilish ideology, it shall focus on the Christian response to such ugly situation. So how do we understand racism? Racism is not an easy word to define as scholars affirm because short and tight definitions can mislead even though in many contexts it cannot be avoided. We would also have to do it in this presentation. This is so because it requires some relatively sophisticated treatment. As a scholar by name Ali Ratansi is of the opinion that I quote, Although racism is a multidimensional phenomenon, it has suffered from formulaic and cliched thinking from all sides of political spectrum. Professional social scientists and historians have been as liable to succumb to the seductions of oversimplification as political activists seeking to mobilize their various constituencies. So Marga M sees racism as an ideology, 
or belief system designed to justify and rationalize racial and ethnic inequality. With regards to discrimination, he opines that it is most basically a behavior aimed at denying members of particular ethnic groups equal access to societal rewards. Political brutality against Black American, for example, Black American males, which is the use of excessive physical force or verbal assault and psychological intimidation, has been a theme of great concern in the area of racism. Many notions of racism around abound but can simply be described as some form of bigotry or prejudice one group of people may have towards another. And sometimes racism can actually be institutionalized, otherwise called institutionalized racism, as coined by one Stockley, Kamikar, and Charles Hamilton. So racism can be seen as an ideological construction which rests on social construction rather than genetic features, because it seems to want to divide persons based on ethnic differences. So it's not something really genetically because it cannot be proven. It has more to do with a societal construction. Now, when it comes to describing and defining racism, a lot of confusion abound because many people accused of racism defend themselves with the argument that their actions are simply a patriotic aspiration. This usually is from superiority complex, which even invents certain scientific language to support their, opposi their position, where racism is viewed as any claim of natural superiority of one identifiable human population, group or race over another. So by scientific racism, it's meant the attempt to use the language and some of the techniques of science to support of theories or contention that particular groups or populations are innately inferior to others in terms of intelligence, civilization, or even socially defined attitudes. In defense of racism, some scholars opine that it is simply the product of natural human attributes, such as the willingness of human groups, especially nations, to protect their own kind and their own territories, forms of self-survival that inevitably involves acting defense, defensively on the basis of stereotypes, which may rest on limited knowledge, but demonstrate sensible caution now, what some see as a form of racism is viewed instead as thinking and behavior that are rare and make common sense. It is only human nature to act in this manner. And it is believed this is just as well for the survival of individuals, cultures, and nations. There is a strange kind of enigma in this sense associated with the problem of racism because no one or almost nobody wishes to see themselves as racist. Still, racism persists. It is real and tenacious. So how do we define racism? From the Webster Dictionary, racism is a belief that race is a primary determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Longman's Dictionary of Contemporary English sees it this way, unfair treatment of people or violence against them because they belong to a different race from your own. That belief that different races of people have different characters and abilities and that the qualities of your own race are the best. One Linda Cares, Carter, opines that the word for religious discrimination is racism. It was coined in France in the 1930s in reference to the way the Jews were being treated. In addition to the 6 million of them exterminated, are the 20 million Orthodox Christians 
also wiped out as racial inferiors by Aryan supremacists. So in Europe, the word is freely used to describe any scenario in which vulnerable groups are mistreated and or exploited. Religious or ethnicity is usually a common delineator. Racism today is freely used to define or describe any scenario wherein groups that are vulnerable get mistreated or exploited with a common delineator, usually ethnicity or religious creed. Therefore, this European concept of racism is what I use in this presentation. Whenever I refer to racism, it brings together best both racial discrimination or religious discrimination. So let's talk about the reality of racism. First and foremost, we must acknowledge that racism is a human creation. It is developed by social factors and hierarchy between ethnic groups and religious supremacists. So by its nature, it is really not based on any scientific or chemical makeup that constitute the difference among the people in question. This may be based solely on skin, color, or religious affiliations. The same attitude could be true of religious bigotry, whereby one religion is perceived to be superior or better than the other, and it creates some false sense of superiority to the extent that those who do not belong to my religion are enemies to my religion and must be persecuted when this leads to a full-blown prejudice, which is an unreasonable dislike and distrust of people who are different from me in some way, especially because of their race, their sex, religion, etc. So in reality, the action of racists have got to do more with their hearts, which are in themselves evil, and with the persecution of others from which they actually need conversion from the Christian understanding. So it is because there is war in their hearts that they kill from the letter to J letter of James chapter four, verse one to two, we read this. And according to Fulton Sheen, wars are only projections of the conflict which inside the soul of modern men and women for nothing happens in the external world that does not first happen within the soul. And so all external manifestations are about what is conceived within the heart. But as we usually say in English, to kill a dog, you give it a bad name. So the evil of racism. It is a historical fact and on record that many brutal realities of painful nature have been done or mated on innocent and unsuspected victims in the name of racism. Millions have lost their lives from the Holocaust. From the Holocaust to ISIS, Boko Haram here in Northern Nigeria, all as a result of explicit acts that are racist in nature. These evils are far from being ended because Injuries and injustices in the name of racism has continued to be perpetrated and sometimes even institutionalized. Now these take different forms, either as racial profiling, racial police profiling, for instance, in the United States, which has led to the Black Lives Matter movement with the mother of George Floyd of, Floyd of recent, being the straw that broke the camel's back on a lot of things. Boko Haram terrorism, which is religious in nature, and Islamic sect, which delights in shedding the blood of non-Muslims, and some Muslims they perceive to be infidels who must be eliminated, and they have murdered thousands in the name of Allah, and have kidnapped and raped many girls. And a case in point is that of Rebecca Beatrice, whom I hope to share her experience today. It is a very pathetic situation. So the sinfulness of racism from the Christian perspective is rooted in the assumption that 
one rest is more valuable and more superior to the other, which is pride. And this leads one not to love because loving will imply descending to an inferior. Such attitude even goes to the extent of an undefined hatred and resentment towards others. Such action imply one is not living as God intended because he created humanity in perfect relationship with himself. So the evil of racism is rooted in the fact that it invariably denies the fact that we were all created equally in the image and likeness of God of which the church affirms and I quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church number 1935. The equality of men rests essentially on their dignity as persons and the rights that flow from it. So let us look at the victims of racism and the response of humanity. Those who become victims of tragedies of racism or any form of discrimination never actually expect their days ending abruptly. These deaths and tortures are far too common than we can actually imagine. It does unimaginable harm to the human family and actually deprives the larger community of benefiting from the would have been contributions of victims to the common good of the human family. It therefore makes us all handicapped in the light of the aforementioned, we all are either affected or infected. And as such, no one can afford to sit back and actually imagine it is something far away from me. This is living in self-deception and in denial. It is rightly here that the world needs to stand up against such maladies all together and aggressively, but bloodlessly attack this disease. This beast called racism has to be defeated by all of us. We must all resist the temptation of supposing that it does not affect me as I am okay where I live. None of these deplorable situations are found around me. But such a position is a risky one. To think that I am safe, for to think in this manner is to live dangerously because what has not reached you has not passed you by. And we must always have that at the back of our minds. Because it has not come to me, I must not imagine it has not passed by. Because someday it will be there should we refuse to all together put our hands to deck and fight it. So the human response to such maladies, the world needs to act <coughs> against it. For as long as we play the ostrich and think it will not get to me, then acts of this nature, which may assume one form of discrimination or another, will someday, like wildfire, consume all of us. As an African, let me tell you a story. Maybe this will cheer us all up. And uh, on a farm, there lived a farmer in some remote village of Africa who had a farm and he set a trap for rodents on his farm. So the rodents consulted one another in the family kingdom and said, look, we need to remove this trap because it may get some of us. But the cock said, well, traps do not affect me and so I do not need to remove it, let it be there because I can jump it over. The goat said, the traps are not on my route. And so I don't need to do anything about it, let it be there. Then the monkey said, I'm very swift. I can jump over traps. So eventually the trap was never removed. But something mysterious happened. The wife of the farmer came to the farm to pick vegetables and she mistake, mistakenly got to the trap and the trap got her at her foot. It got so 
terrible that it injured her. So when the medicine man was invited to intervene, he demanded for the veins of monkey to stitch the deep cut of the trap. And the monkey had to be killed. Secondly, he needed goat fat to heal the scars and the goat had to be killed. And thirdly, they needed chicken for nutrition and the chicken had to be killed. At the end, the goat, the monkey and the cock all lost their lives because they were not ready to cooperate to get rid of the trap. This could have been avoided had they listened to the rodents who asked for help and obliged. I do not know if this story makes sense, but the main line is that when we think it doesn't affect us, it actually does. And that is living dangerously. Now of recent, the world was moved to a standstill when George Floyd was killed by a cop. Judge Floyd died on what should have been a relatively ordinary day, on a day he should have returned safely to his home and family. But he died for being black. He died for being himself. He died for being one whose skin ordinarily based on pigmentation was colored. Pope Francis commented on his death. And this is what he said, I caught. I have witnessed with great concern the disturbing social unrest in your nation in these past days, following the tragic death of Mr. George Floyd. We cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. This is pathetic. Every life must be defended and every life matters from conception to its natural death. Now the Boko Haram and my personal experience. The Boko Haram experience has been something very terrible that whenever I think of Boko Haram, I get emotional. But it's a reality that we cannot run away from. When it happens to one, it's a sign that we need to curb it before it gets to us. In 2014, the world was greeted by the shocking breaking news of the kidnap of 276 schoolgirls. The night of 14th to 15th of April was a night to remember directly by the direct victims and indirectly by those of us who had relatives in this group. For a great lot of us who were, who happened to be from this part of the region, this happening, <coughs> excuse me, was the straw that broke the camel's back as this shocking situation only brought to limelight some of the horrific and terrible stories which began to be heard. As hitherto, no one seemed to have believed our situation. We live in a region where Islamic terrorism is tearing us apart. I had some of my cousins, three of whom were kidnapped. And you know what it means for the family not to see their loved ones and not to hear anything about, just to see the media talk about them. And some of the horrific videos that come out from the Boko Haram camp to say how these girls have either been sold into slavery or have been raped, have been tortured. And of course, <clears throat> a lot have died. Some were lucky to have escaped to come back alive, but the situation is terrible. I want to share with you the story of Rebecca Beatrice. This lady who was married with her husband, had two kids, was invaded because the village was invaded and she stood strong enough to defend her husband, whom she wanted to escape to safety. And when Rebecca eventually was captured by the Boko Haram Islamic terrorists, 
she was taken to an unknown location. And for three years, we did not know where Rebecca was. However, to cut the long story short, she survived and surfaced. But during her captivity, Rebecca suffered horrible things, among which are, number one, when she was forced to convert to Islam, she refused. She was given all the kind of tortures unimaginable that this world can give to make her change her mind, which she refused to. One of the things mated on her was one of her children was killed before her eyes, thrown into the lake, the lake Chad, and this child was allowed to be drowned. She tried to reach out to the child. Each time they pulled her out of the water, and they wanted her to watch how this child dies. And it ended up that bad. And when the child died, she wept bitterly. And she had one son left. And that one son was sold into slavery. And she was left alone. And she was given the choice. It's either she became a slave herself or accept to convert. She insisted. She needed no conversion. If they kill her, fine, but she wouldn't convert and she remained a Christian. And so she was left to do all the chores within the camp. And eventually she was forcefully married off to a man and she refused to ever have the man touch her. And this is what she did. Sorry to say this, but it's not to offend any of your sensibilities with regards to the story, but so that you can know the horrific acts that racism can cause. She decided never to bathe her body. And in fact, sometimes she said, I used feces over my body so I won't be attractive to the man. And she survived for more than a year with this trick. However, one day, she was forcefully washed by the people around and she was raped by the man who is supposed to be her first husband while the others stood to pin her to the ground. And from that act, to tell you, Rebecca got pregnant and she escaped eventually from the camp, but she escaped just the week she had the baby. And today I can tell you, Rebecca, who I believe is healed, has rejoined her husband with a son belonging to this terrorist whom she baptized Jonathan. You know what it means to live with such a scar? And she is a living witness of what the Christian response ought to be. So how should the Christian respond to such a situation? <coughs> to, <coughs> to answer this question <coughs> on the Christian response to religious discrimination, we need to understand the uniqueness inherent in the Christian moral teaching. Number one, the Christian novelty, the novelty in Christianity, which anthropologically responds to the problem of racism, lies in understanding the unique newness Christ brings basically rooted in the common denominator by all, namely humanity. The interest of Christianity is not to make proselytes where she gets crazy about making more members, rather it is soteriological, where the human person in its totality is brought to bear. Therefore, in the Catholic theological understanding of the different branches, or rather the different tracts of dogmatic theology, anthropology, Christology, and soteriological are necessarily interrelated, and they are mutually inclusive as far as the human condition as fallen is concerned. So anthropologically, human identity is relational. And as such, no one is so wealthy that he or she does not need a neighbor. 
And no one is so poor that he or she has nothing to offer. So what is most needed is the understanding of this shared reality called humanity. So at the heart of his teaching, Jesus emphasized forgiveness. Jesus changed humanity forever with his modification of the ancient revenge laws and brought a newness on which the redemption of the world depends. The novelty of Christianity to the human cycle of revenge is incredibly extraordinary. Prior to Christ was the Amorabic law, which was the best possible form of justice imaginable, which taught tit for tat in the religious cycle. However, pragmatically speaking, it is not possible to pay one back, to pay one wrong back with another. Even in monetary value, it changes with a tickle of the clock. So, so much that we cannot pay back what we have borrowed from a lender as far as his value is concerned. Here, the story of the merchant of Venice comes to mind. If we remember the story of Shylock and the pound of flesh, you can have your pound of flesh, but drop no blood. You know that is not possible. And that explains exactly how revenge can never be the answer. So to solve this riddle, Jesus brings novelty to humanity. Something unheard of, unimaginable, unthinkable, and seemingly impossible, but practicable. The teaching of Jesus on what? Turning the other cheek. Confirm Luke chapter 6, verse 29. And it's called to forgive, to forgive one's enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5, 44. This is by far the most noble teaching in the history of humanity. But why would Jesus do such, we may ask. Jesus does it because the church in her magisterium teaches that only in the person of Jesus does the mystery of the human person put on light. Gaudium et Spes number 22. So we see that Jesus was not just a theoretical teacher, but also a pragmatical, a pragmatic personality. He practiced what he taught in an extraordinary way. When on Calvary to his killers, those who crucified him, he pronounced, forgive them father for they know not what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. Sometimes very important here, something very important here, which we must underscore is the basis on which Jesus forgives, ignorance of the perpetrators of such acts. So it is basically on this ground that the church's teaching is rooted when it comes to dealing with people who engage in acts of violence ignorantly, even when they claim to have just reasons that are subjective. How should they be treated? They should be treated with love. <laughs> they need to be educated, be it in the areas of religious difference or political affiliations or racial diversity. Education, the Christian antidote to acts of racism and religious discrimination is the way of education. As far as the teaching of the magisterium is concerned, I quote, the international community is aware that the roots of racism, discrimination and intolerance are found in prejudice and ignorance, which are first of all, the fruits of sin, but also of faulty and inadequate education. There are two sides to such education. On the one hand is the civil, on the other is religious. While the former is basically anthropological, the latter is rooted in the need to wade faith and reason. Now from the anthropological side, the church understands the mystery of the human person in its capacity as imago Dei, the image of God, and as such uses all means available to educate man on his nature and the need to respect all men and women, and such must be encouraged. The magisterium places value on the centrality of the human person in any community with their natural inclination to establish strong bonds and relationship among themselves as fundamental for building the human society with the aim of achieving effective result of common good. It also laments the aspiration as not yet achieved despite all efforts around the world, both religious and socially. And this is due to obstacles 
originating in materialistic and nationalistic ideologies that contradict the value of the person integrally considered in all his various dimensions, material and spiritual, individual and community. In particular, any theory or forms whatsoever of racism and racial discrimination must be morally denounced and it is unacceptable. So education on faith and reason, it must be noted that the credibility of faith actually depends on its reasonability and the credibility of reason depends on its fidelity. This is because if faith must be credible, it must be reasonable. And if reason must be believable, it must be credible. So the Catholic faith calls for belief in all those things contained in divine revelation, be it scripture and tradition. So from both faith and reason, we need to balance the equation, especially when it comes to religion today. There is no religion that is superior to the other. There is no religion that is better, to the, best, better than other. If we do not weigh faith and reason together, we risk these problems. <coughs> Probably understood, when faith and reason are separated, we have problem. But reason without faith, we know that, gives room to skepticism. It gives room to cynicism and even nihilism. And this leads to desperation. Faith, on the other hand, without reason, becomes fundamentalism, extremism, and violence ends it all. And that is what we have in religious cycles that persecute others based on faith, because their faith has no balance from reason. And those who are too rational without faith lead the world to nihilism. So solidarity with the human family. So the teaching magisterium of the church insists that solidarity must be fostered among states, but also within every society where a process of dehumanization and disintegration of the social fabric undeniable, undeniably aggravates racist and kind of xenophobic attitudes and behavior. Such negative process results in rejection of the weakest, be it the foreigner, the handicapped or the homeless. Solidarity must be based upon the unity of the human family because all people created in the image and likeness of God have same origin and are called to the same destiny. In the words of John Paul II, solidarity is the only path forward out of the complete moral bankruptcy of racial prejudice and ethnic animosity. Solidarity is an eminently Christian virtue. It practices the sharing of spiritual goods, even more than material ones. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1948. Finally, my dear listeners, forgiveness can never be overemphasized in the Christian understanding because it is the foundation of religion itself. But forgiveness does not excuse culpability. We must accept and deny and denounce the fact that racism is evil, it is sinful, but we have to forgive in order to forge ahead. <coughs> so, so no matter how deep one ever gets hurt by whatever acts of hatred or dislike, the way out is forgiveness. Forgiveness does not excuse the offenses. Rather, it acknowledges and denounces it. And at the same time, try to heal the offender. When worse comes to worse, when prejudice leads to maximum hatred for minimum reasons, we must never forget as Christians that we are not to be afraid of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul, but fear him who can destroy both in hell. So finally, we can see that in the lives of people who have been persecuted for one reason or the other, Christianity has practiced forgiveness. John Paul, too, of blessed memory, he said, we all need forgiveness from others so we must all be ready to forgive. And this he practiced as an antidote to the hatred when he forgave Muhammad Ali Agga, who shot him in an attempt to eliminate him on 13 July 1981 at St. Peter's Square. In the words of the pontiff, real peace is not just a matter of structures and mechanisms. It rests above all 
on the adoption of a style of human coexistence marked by mutual acceptance and a capacity to forgive from the heart. We all need to be forgiven by others as we must all be ready to forgive. Asking and granting forgiveness is something profoundly worthy of every one of us. When George Floyd was killed, this was what his fiance said. <laughs> he, she called for forgiveness of the cop who killed him saying, I quote, <coughs> you know, if he was here, he would say, he's a man of God. <coughs> he would stand on, the, on this family. He stood for people. He was there for people when they were down. He loved people that were thrown away. And so forgiveness, even in the case of George Floyd, was what his family called for. Rebecca Beatrice, whom I gave this story when she was violated, her words were, I forgive them because I am a Christian. We have been called to forgive. And I live with the scars of this encounter. However bad it is, I have forgiven. Tough as hard as it may appear is the only way. We have the case of Asia baby from Pakistan who was in prison for many years. She said this, I forgive my persecutors, those who have falsely accused me as I await their forgiveness. Although I have been in prison for seven years, I do not hate those who did me wrong. I have forgiven them. And so the basic requirement in this regard, my listeners, there is no way out for the Christian healing for both those who are victims and the offenders than forgiveness. Because forgiveness frees both the victim and the offender. And so when it comes to racism, irrespective of what I may feel as a person, one thing I must remember, forgiveness is the only way out. And that healing is required for both the races and the victims from the Christian understanding, since both need to be liberated from the injury inflicted upon them in different ways. With this, I say, thank you for listening. God bless you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Uh, I would now like to call upon Cape Breton University student, D'Angelo Woodside, who is also on the Cape Breton University basketball team, and he's also on the track and field team. He throws the foot with me, and uh, we're very happy to have uh, to have Angelo ask his question now. I'm all ears. Angelo. Okay, we're going to go to one of our students that are in the office here with me, some of the students, and uh, they're going to ask their question while he gets ready, Angelo gets ready. And we'll only be, we'll only have time for a couple of questions, and then there will be a song by another Cape Breton University student, Felicity. Okay, come on, come here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi there. Hello. Hi. So you were talking about uh, prejudice and sin, you know, the root cause for maybe, you know, like being racist. Can I ask your question? Yeah. Just ask it. Yeah. So the, so don't you think like, you know, like uh, forgiveness and stuff like, you know, like uh, things that can be used uh, to remove this root cause be included in the curriculum of studies? Shouldn't it be taught in schools? Like, you know, like you should forgive or like, you know, uh, prejudice can make uh, things worse. Because as you said, like uh, it hasn't, I haven't experienced it, but it's still present on, you know, by, it's passing by me, but someday it would come to me too. So shouldn't it be like in the school curriculum or like you know, at the university or at a 
at a higher level that rather than just being, you know, just a uh, environment where we are just like 20 people or 30 people talking about it. So, okay, thanks for your question. Now, my take is, as far as the church is concerned, education is key. And school curriculum should in a kind of include a kind of a, a program that will expose them, not just to forgiveness in the blue, because we understand forgiveness differently, but from the root in the sense that when the church speaks about faith and reason, we must be open to know that there exists other than us, something that is different because not all contraries are contradictory. They can actually be complementary. And so I fully support that this should be introduced in the universities so that people who live within a world that do not have access or have never experienced such can have it at the back of their mind so that when it comes around, they will have a better approach to face the reality. So I concur and I support. I don't know if I've answered you <clears throat> or should I continue? Yeah, I, I, I understood like, you know, like, uh, but my point was like, it's just like, you know, uh, it should be like, a, you should approach the university to, you know, like uh, to include that in the curriculum. That, that's what it is like you answered my question but it's just like you know it's my opinion would be to just put it out front uh you know like put your thoughts into play or action okay in uh, in my country for instance we have the the interreligious dialogue it's a program that tries to take into cognizance our diversity of religions. And because of this wrong education of superiority over another, the curriculum is, 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 is made part of the formation such that people get to understand, look, I am only one out of many. Different countries have this phobia for religion and they do not want to include it as part of their curriculum. So I don't know how <coughs> it, will, it, it will go for me, for instance, to be able to suggest it to other countries. You have to understand first how they operate, but it is possible. All I'm trying to say, it's possible to include this in the universities, depending on the disposition of the country in question. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask uh, D'Angelo if he's there. D'Angelo. Doesn't seem to be there. Felicity, are you present? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, D'Angelo, okay. Here's D'Angelo Woodside with his question. Okay. Um, I don't really have a question for se. More of like a, more of like a statement, you know. Okay. I just feel as though like I just feel as though like I went to I grew up in high school and junior high in the U.S. and so the state that I went to junior high and senior high was in Mount Virginia, and. Like that's the first time I really like experienced like racism in my life. I never actually experienced it before like that, besides from, you know, just seeing it. I'm actually from the Bahamas and stuff like that. I'm born, but I raised, I grew up in the US. And so like, you know, for me, seeing what happened, like, for example, I remember a time we went in the church like after, before a basketball game because we like wanted to go to church and stuff like that and we went to this church and it was just 
all white in there. Like everybody was white. And the guy he came up to us and he was like, you know, hey buddy, this is not the church for y'all to be in. And so like we just looked around and he when he said that, I was like, wow. And so like like he wasn't trying to be like rude, but at the same time, he was like being straight up with us, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And so we had to he showed us a church to go to and stuff like that. So we went there and stuff, but just say that to say, like, you know, to me, it's a mindset. You know, we can't change laws. Can't change the way people think. It's just a mindset, you know, and to me is, well, I, uh, well, I have a kind of a question, you know, and it, it, it just is, how can we closer to core, care, change the face. way people think? How can we put in a perspective how people think? How can we put in perspective how people raise their children? How can we change that? Because like kids are growing up and you know, you can't get mad at them if they think a certain way. Just like if a kid come to, come up to me and be and say the N-word, I can't get mad at him if he doesn't know, you know. And then they, you gotta be able to change minds, you know, and just ask, like, you know, gotta find a way to be like, you know, how can we change the minds of people around here? Like, how can we effectively do this? Like, the BLM, you know, they protesting and they putting out stuff there, you know, and it's just to bring in awareness. It's not more so to say, hey, change this in the system, change that in the system. The system is already there for a reason. It's just, you know, trying to, you know, put in a way as we could change these things that was happening, on, happening around the world. Like all around the world, you can't just say the U.S. Although the U.S. has more, but I would say you know how can we effectively put put things in perspective that we can like change minds. And you know, at the end of the day, we gotta ask as Christians and as believer as believers of God, we gotta ask you know God like you know how can how can these stuff get put into place in schools, churches jobs you know all these different stuff we gotta ask how can these things be effective and if you know if it can't be things only go worse it's only it's it, it, it from then to now you know it's more subliminal so you can't really see it but it's there still d'angelo d'angelo are you comfortable showing uh, the video which video your your video oh sure, See you. sure. Um, just click on video yeah give me a minute just hit um, stop uh, or start video and maybe father beatrice you could respond to him okay as you said basically in my paper i try to say that racism is a creation it's a social creation. There is no scientific justification or scientific or genetic explanation for racism when it comes to do, when it has to do with different races. And for religious difference, there is actually no grounded reason to say one is superior to the other. Right. What is most needed is a kind of education that will raise people to understand the other. Because anthropologically, we are relational. We need the other person. Our identity right. is spelt by the other. So right from the families, people have to be educated in such a way, since the world has become a global village, we now understand there is black, there is white, brown or whatever color you give, what matters is a person. But if people have not been taught right from the families, which right. the church says, right. the family is the nuclear church. Any education <laughs> that does not have its root founded from the family may, may not bear so much fruit. Right. Because in the university settings, there are certain educational subjects that is not forced on all, depending on what you are studying. Right. So I think this has to do with the society 
of which philosophers of old had the opinion that the government be in charge of this. Unfortunately, political divide has worsened the situation. People cash in when there is divide and conquer, right. while others mourn their death, others celebrate their gains. Right. So I think, D'Angelo, it is possible to educate. It is always possible if we have the right disposition. Right, right, right. Right, right. And so like, you know, like students today, some students, <coughs> the uh, racism in universities and stuff like that, you know? And, you know, it's just, it's a matter of, like you said, you know, just educating and, you know, it's a touch, it's a touchy, it's a touchy subject, you know? You put it, it's, it's a very touchy subject because, you know, you gotta, you gotta be careful how you say certain words and you gotta be careful how you how you bring it up. You can't just bring it up and you know you just say the wrong thing. You don't know who you affected in that class. Exactly. It's a very touchy subject. We can just be honest about that. So it's like, you know, you, uh, you have to be careful how you say it and then you have to do your research. And so like, you know, I, I wouldn't say anybody's qualified to say speak on it. But at the end of the day, we need someone that is out there to in schools that, you know, who's qualified to do these things and that who's not scared to say we can touch on the subject. Or we can just open it up to, you know, different kids in school. And that, that could mean any race. We can bring this up and we can talk about it and we can see how we can like make every student in campus feel comfortable. You know, from any different part of the world, you can make them feel as comfortable as possible. You know, because I've even heard here like kids from India and all these different other countries felt racism down here in Cape Britain. And it's, I was kind of amazed, but I didn't even know that. I was like, this is a small town. I didn't expect like nothing to happen here. But I mean, I mean, hey, you know, they felt it. So it was like, you know, something that has to be done, you know. And it's something that, you know, we got to be able to have different conversations about and how we gonna bring this up to like leaders and stuff like that, how we can how we can find a solution of like changing the way we approach things, you know. Because what if that person didn't come off as they, they don't they didn't think that they were coming off as racist as racist, but how that person took it from that different country was like, uh, what are you saying to me? Are you calling me out? You know, are you like saying that just because I'm from this place, you're saying that I don't deserve this or I don't deserve that? You know, but that's how they perceive it. And so like, that's why I feel as though like, it can't just be any and anybody who discussing the, who, who, who would discuss these things out there, you know, it has to be people who are qualified and it has to be people that, you know, who are not scared in the first place, you know, because I'm going to perceive it. I'm going to look, I, I'm always a person who's going to look at, who's going to listen to you and be like, you know, let me see what he's saying. Let me see who's saying this. Why is it, or why they are saying this, you know, and let me see what subjects could they really touch on. And when they really touch on these subjects, let me be attentive to see like how they speak on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, uh, so it's like, you know, how we can, it, it, it's still amazing to see me all the way in 2020, getting ready to be in 2021. And we still trying to find a way how we can change minds after all these years. Yeah. You think this would stop by now, you know? And it, it, to me, it's just getting, people are being blinded by it, by like, doing it more hidden now. So it's like racism in a hidden way. It's not bleeding as it used to be, at least in some areas it are, but it's not that blatant anymore, I would say. But it's still okay. amazing to me to see that we are in 2020, getting ready to be in 2021. And guys my age are still calling racism. You know, younger kids than me still calling racism. You know, it's just amazing to me to see it still happening to this day, you know. 
I always thought that at some point in time that it could stop. I always thought that for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know why growing up I always thought it would. I always thought racism and discrimination would stop. I always thought stuff like that would just end one of these days. But to me, well, it, it apparently it's never going to stop. You know. Or you could hope and pray that, you know, these things and more people could take it serious, you know, and, you know, be more effective with how they put it out there. And like meetings like these will even help others to understand, hey, we got to take the initiative in doing this. We got to take the initiative in doing that. How we approach these things, how we talk to people, you know, how can we change all these different mindsets? these different kids that are coming up in school. There's even guys who are coming up after me and then guys who are coming up after them. You know, how can we help change them, make them in a comfortable spot? You know, I'd be happy if someone coming up in a university who's black like me and have a whole four years and then them no racism. I think that's a big change right there. That's a big step. But they never felt it in their four years. You know? Exactly. You know. Thank you. Thank you, D'Angelo. Um, we'll have the response and then we'll have our closing song. An inspiring song, song Felicity. Bob yes, uh, D'Angelo, you made a very good observation, but you have to understand right. from the beginning of the paper, I did say the times may not look optimistic, but the only thing we can rely on is hope itself. Indeed. And that is what our faith is rooted. Right. That is where our faith, our faith is rooted. Right. So Awareness is the key, just as you observe. There has been more awareness towards this, but the awareness should not actually make us, you know, grow a kind of stiff and lukewarm in the sense that we can be passive. There are people, because of the fear of racism, they don't want to have anything to do with maybe people of color where it has to do with color. Right. But then that is not active. Right. Yeah, it's not active. We've got to, to cross the Rubicon when it comes to that and cross cultures and reach hearts mm -hmm. and see that beneath our skin, we all have the same blood. Exactly. We may not get there right. as we think we can, but someday we'll get there. If you look at Martin Luther, Junior King, he fought and he gave his life. Today's situations are better for the black Americans. So with such historical fact that has been hopeful and we have seen results somewhere, somehow, we've got to believe with the internet and 2021 today, we are really cross, crossing a lot of things. Awareness has been created. I am just hopeful someday we'll get there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Father Beatrice, thank you to the students for their questions. I would now like to end on a very inspiring note with uh, Felicity. She's a CBU student who's also an opera singer. She'll be singing um, hmm. Ode to Music. Felicity. Hello. Hi, Felicity. Hi, can you see me? Not yet. Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes, dear. No? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Felicity, and uh, today I'll be singing Schubert's Andy Musik, which is um, an ode to music. Uh, for me personally, music has uh, always helped, meant that um, we connect together as a people through the hard times and through the happy times. And uh, in the poetry for Andy Musik, which was written by Franz Schober, he describes it as um, music lifting him out of the gray turmoils of life into a better world. And I find that very beautiful and very true for myself. And I hope that I can translate that today. In a moment. You're gonna do great. Oh, I do, I 
You're doing great, dear. Did she mute herself or something? Oh, no, she's talking to her mother, I guess. Let's make a new uh, job, right? Yeah. Hi, sorry, I'll try that again. Thank you very much, Felicity. Very beautiful. Wunderbar. I would now like to uh, end the evening. I'd like to thank you, Father Beatrice, for your wonderful lecture tonight, for teaching us about the importance of, of avoiding that equality narrative of tit for tat, but that forgiveness is necessary to break the cycle of, of hate. And that Perhaps the solution is found in solidarity with all of us together, uh, working together to eliminate racism. I know, I know Pope Francis has recommended solidarity as a way forward in promoting each person in the image and likeness of God, as you rightly said, the, the, the image of God. So on behalf of everyone at the Newman Society and Cape Breton University, I wish to thank you, Father Beatrice, uh, for your presence here tonight with us all the way from Africa, for your inspiring words and your emotional true testimony. And if you can forgive, then all of us can, and we can break this cycle and work on educating, educating all of us around the world. Because when one is unsafe, none of us are safe. Thank you. And thank you all for being with us. We had approximately 40 people tonight. Uh, 
lecture for the Father Greg McLeod lecture series. I'd like to simply end by saying uh, the next lecture, second semester, will be Mary Jo Letty from Romero House on March the 10th, 2021. We hope to see you then. God bless you all, and thank you. Thank you.